Uh, my role uh, at this time is to uh, talk a little bit about cachexia, and that's something that, of course, is uh, after breakfast, my role is to make you feel less bad about the breakfast we just had. Um, the, the challenge brought to us by cancer cachexia, I always remember that in this patient I saw who had uh, carcinoma of the bladder, but what you see is that not only the patient had uh, the, the little bit of pain associated with the disease and metastatic bone disease, the fatigue, and uh, of course the psychosocial distress, but a massive amount of weight loss. Both fat and muscle are lost. And when I started working in cachexia many years ago, our patients had this look. And since then, uh, we need to remember that cachexia might have a different face. The BMI of the population has increased dramatically. So patients might be profoundly cachectic and dying of cachexia, but might not look cachectic. And so it's important to remember that more than 50% of our cancer patients have a BMI of more than 25% uh, at this time. And so weight loss has a devastating effect. Loss of muscle mass has a devastating effect, but we might not look like the patient I showed you at the beginning. And we need to uh, make sure that we don't wait until that moment to suspect it and make the diagnosis. The mean weight loss is 7.5 kilos, but people still have a very high BMI. There's decreased muscle and there is decreased shape of the muscle. If you look at the MRI of those muscles, they don't look the same. They look with a different level of attenuation. So it can happen with high BMI. And these are people who have weight, a considerable amount of muscle loss, decreased albumin, and they have higher mortality to almost any therapy we give them. And we need to remember that that happens in the context of multiple other symptoms. So managing cachexia is important and managing it in the context of the other symptoms is very important. We know that BMI more than 25 somehow is protective and we'll show you that uh, in a moment. Uh, weight loss decreases survival. Decreased muscle decreases survival and decreased muscle attenuation so the shape of that muscle, the infiltration of fat in our muscles also decreases survival. The old view was cancer imposed a, 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 you know, a, an energetic demand and we lost weight and also produced some toxins that de lose, uh, decreased our appetite. And so basically it was the more cancer we had, the more cachexia because the cancer ate too much. But the reality is we can, uh, a cancer kills us between 100,000 and a million cells, and that can be fed with three or four uh, spoons of sugar. So it's not that it is a direct consumption. We have learned over the years that the problem is that the disease, the tumor products, and my response to the presence of the tumor causes metabolic changes. And then the appetite is a marker of those metabolic changes rather than being really the main cause of the problem. There is a big difference between starving and having cachexia. My energy expenditure in cachexia is increased while in starving is decreased. Uh, the proteins, protein synthesis is increased, but of course the proteolysis is largely increased and is not that much at all for starvation. And then lipolysis is the main problem in starvation, while proteolysis is the main problem in cachexia. So it's not starvation, and that's a useful concept. Now, many years ago, this study with 3,000 patients uh, done with the ECOG group showed basically that uh, the majority of these patients, very few of these patients, had uh, zero weight loss, particularly with the main common cancers. And uh, the exceptions were hematological and breast, where weight loss at the moment of diagnosis is less common. But then what was clear is that for almost every cancer, weight loss is associated with less survival. No matter what treatment we give, when, we, when people have weight loss at the moment of diagnosis, the prognosis is worse. And when we looked at weight loss and performance status, it was also clear that worse performance status was much more common in people who had weight loss. 
Now, this study by Martin and her group from, from the Edmonton area uh, was very interesting to me because what these people did is they found, first of all, with regards to weight, the same thing. The more weight loss you have, the more likely you are to die and the less likely you are to survive. But they added the component of not only how much you lose, but where did you start? And people who started with a higher BMI had a chance to, uh, the, the, as the BMI decreased, their survival also decreased. But if you started with a higher BMI, and I think this shows it very nicely, your, your mortality was going to be a little bit less. This is the survival in months as compared to if you started with a lower BMI. This is weight loss. So for the same amount of weight loss, those who had a low BMI did worse than those who had a high BMI. And of course, when you combine weight loss with starting with a low BMI, then the survival is quite dismal. So if you start your cancer and you begin your disease with a higher BMI, your survival is a little bit better than if even at the moment of diagnosis or before your BMI was not that, that high. So this shows the curves and they discriminate quite well survival uh, according to uh, the presence of BMI and weight loss. Now, how do we diagnose cachexia? The international consensus says that more than 5% weight loss in less than six months uh, or Remember what we said about 20 uh, BMI, that is people who start with a low BMI, any weight loss, literally, when your BMI is less or equal to 20, is cachexia. So that's a very simple way to diagnose it. And then the other ones are called precachexia, etc. There's a more complex group that diagnoses people as precachectic, cachectic, and refractory cachexia. I think from our clinical perspective, if you had more than 5% of your weight loss in the last six months, or if your, weight, your BMI was normal or a little bit lowish and you lost any weight, you are cachectic. And this shows the curves of survival that has just been uh, found that <coughs> that consensus conference is confirmed. When people use that criteria for diagnosing cachexia, the survival is worse when you have cachexia. In the four group model, it's not that clear that it is so useful. Now, how do we measure body composition? Well, of course, in clinical practice, we use body weight, we use uh, body surface, BMI, anthropometrics. Bioelectrical impedance is an exciting thing because you use the BMI machine, but it gives you a slightly different measure of conductance in your tissue. It's bedside, it's done in seconds, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't cost any money, and it can be an independent predictor of survival. And CT scans, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with that because that's an exciting uh, area. Now, there you have the CT scan of people who had reasonably similar BMI, but you see that their skeletal muscle index can be quite different for the same BMI. So what we find here is that the association between the amount of muscle that I can measure in the paravertebral area in the patient is sometimes associated, of course, but it can be quite independent from my, my uh, BMI. And what is really, really important is this amount of muscle I have in my paravertebral um, muscles. And if I, if I shrink that dramatically, my prognosis is independently worse. And so we have now three components. We have the weight loss that is important. We have the BMI with which we started but it's also very important to consider the skeletal mass that I had at the moment of the diagnosis and over the course of the disease. So here you see people with very similar BMI, but dramatically different amount of muscle in the uh, skeletal area. And in this study, they, they just found also a, in, a, in a similar way that sarcopenic obesity is, uh, produces less function than obesity, and sarcopenic obesity is an independent factor of survival. So even if your BMI is very good, if you're sarcopenic, that is, if you're losing muscle, your prognosis is much worse. Now, this shows a little bit of the challenge when you pr uh, prescribe gemcitabine according to a, a body surface, and then when you pres prescribe body surface area, but you, you look at it as a, a proportion of the lean body mass, you can see that the dose 
can be all over the place. There can be a wide variation in the dose when you express it per lean body mass. And it, there's some data coming up already suggesting that for hematological toxicity and need for dose reduction, the, uh, the use of um, the body surface might generate that some people who are sarcopenic might, might have more difficulty than others. And the same thing has been found recently for afatinib, when you're using uh, you know, body mass index, uh, and then you're using the uh, milligrams of afatinib, you see that there is a considerable variation in the amount of afatinib that the patient does get. Now, what are the prognostic factors? We said that BMI high works, weight loss, decreases survival, decreased skeletal muscle, as we said, and decreased muscle attenuation. What are the changes that we have when we develop this uh, cachexia? Our survival goes down, we have more fat fatigue, anorexia, and chronic nausea. We'll discuss autonomic failure and hypogonadic state, immune changes, increased postoperative complications, increased toxicity from chemo, and body image distress. So there are changes that happen to all of us when we get cachexia. Uh, high CRP as a measurement of inflammation, autonomic failure, this phase angle changes of conductance of electricity, low testosterone, low vitamin D, and indirect calorimetry because many of us, we are cachectic, but we behave like a hyperthyroid patient. We, we consume more basal energy than we could afford. And it's about 30% of us who work cachectic, our indirect calorimetry is elevated. So there's primary cachexia, but there, there's a number of complications that make the intake worse. And it's quite worth looking at some of those because we can really change those. So when we have cachexia, the main reason why we have it is a metabolic syndrome, but these are aggravating factors, and taking a look at those can dramatically help your patient start to eat more and feel better, and it can help body composition. When we looked at clinical outcomes in the cachexia clinic we opened, in the first 150 patients, we found out that there were a number of symptoms that could be impacted, and there were a number of interventions that could be established, and all these are contributors to further starvation in your patient. So identifying those in a cachexia assessment makes a lot of sense because you can gain 3, 400, 500 calories a day, and that can be quite meaningful. Now, what were the most common abnormalities? The vast majority of male patients who have cachexia are hypogonadic. Uh, adrenal insufficiency, we didn't find much. Hypothyroidism, not much. And B12 deficiency, not much at all. So all patients with cachexia have undiagnosed problems that reduce food intake. And managing those patients uh, and those problems can be helpful. Now, this shows you a little bit of the consequences of cachexia. This is uh, doing a gastric scan in people who have 12-hour fasting and they eat a radioactive egg sandwich. So this is the way the stomach empties after that. This took 66 minutes to empty half of the radioactive egg sandwich. This is a healthy stomach, an extraordinary healthy stomach, because this is my stomach. And there you can see. How it, now, you can see now a cachectic patient, and in the cachectic patient, by 300 minutes, half of that egg sandwich was still there. These people had been scoped, and there was absolutely nothing structurally wrong. It's just autonomic failure with decreased gastric emptying. That's what metoclopramide can do, and that's what ondansetron cannot do, and that's what the aprepitent cannot do. That's why the very old metoclopramide in your cachectic patient might be a wonderful way to help that food move faster. The other big problem is this is a patient that was reported in my hospital as having a normal x-ray of the abdomen. Well, obviously, that radiologist had not traveled a lot and had not realized that this is, this is the patient is full of stuff. And we not always make the diagnosis, and even people can have a bowel movement uh, every day, but it might not be enough. And constipation 
is a huge problem in these patients. So anorexia, chronic nausea, dyspepsia of cancer can be clearly associated with being uh, constipated. So suspecting it, and we frequently order x-rays of the tummy because the patients don't want to take their laxatives. They say, I'm not constipated, doctor, I'm going. And sometimes we have to take an x-ray to show them that constipation is a big problem. Now, cachexia is a distressing syndrome. And we wanted to know how distressing is it. And we looked at body image dissatisfaction in our patients. And there you can see, this is a marker of significant body dissatisfaction. Uh, and then when people have body dissatisfaction, they had much higher frequency of anxiety, of depression, and basically they, they felt in some cases that it, it might even be their body image was more concerning to them even than the pain and the fatigue and other symptoms because uh, they find it very disfiguring and they find it as a meaning of the disease uh, um, um, uh, killing them. And this is a view of uh, the caregivers also, where we looked at patients and caregivers. And there you have those who had weight loss, substantial weight loss, had a significantly worse uh, BIS score. Now, body image has been measured mostly in breast cancer and some head and neck cancer patients. A cachectic patient has a body image that is much worse than the body image of a breast cancer patient or a head and neck mutilated patient. So that's to give you an idea of the severity of the body image uh, disorder that is associated with significant weight loss. And of course, it was also associated with having more depression, anxiety, and being younger. So what are the predictors of having a very bad body image? It's being younger, uh, having dyspnea, loss of sexual interest, and depression. Those are predictors of having a bad uh, body image. So what can we say about what is doing to the quality of life? When we lose weight, we have physical weakness, we have changes in our body image, they have a message that my disease is progressing, and we also have this complex relationship with my family caregivers who don't like what they're seeing, and they might be increasing my level of distress, and so you have physical problems, you have emotional problems, and that's the way cachexia affects our quality of life. Now, what about increasing my energy intake? I'll show you a little bit that TPN mostly is not very useful. Enteral also is not very useful. The, we're working on food supplements and dietary counseling. There's no doubt that there's an association between cachexia and all these complications we discussed a little bit before. Now, why do they happen? Well, it could be that if I develop cachexia, I will have immunosuppression, I will have inflammation, and I will ha have decreased uh, autonomic failure, and this will lead to these complications. Uh, diabetic patients with a stomach like I showed you and a colon like I showed you have a much higher frequency of sudden death. And if we look at a cancer patient, we say that people die of cancer, but in reality, we die of cancer because we develop an infection, and it's usually subtle because we don't make as much pus, because we clot, or because our heart stops suddenly. And cachexia can be associated with these three complications. Now, what is the evidence that aggressively nourishing my patient are going to make a difference? And that's where the frustration starts. And there is no evidence. There were multiple randomized controlled trials of parenteral nutrition. Uh, when we, and that by that I include myself, believed that it was an energy problem, we did randomized controlled trials comparing total parenteral nutrition with controls, and regrettably, the results were, uh, were generally negative. And there were also no major differences in toxicity. Now, why would that be? You might say, you have a problem, you give nutrition. Well, partially it's because the factory is on strike. And if I inject someone amino acids and fatty acids and glucose, and I expect the body to use that to manufacture hormones, enzymes, and lean body mass, the body just cannot take advantage. It cannot use it to make what is necessary to change toxicity and change mortality. So part of the problem is the factory is on strike. You can bring as much wood as you want. You're not going to get chairs made. 
You got, we have to find ways to take that factory, that metabolic factory out of their strike, put it to work again. Then when we bring the energy, it will be used. And that's part of what we are doing these days or trying to do these days. Now, food supplements are of some interest. Vitamins make a lot of sense because the new beriberi, the new kwashiorkor, the new uh, syndromes of lack of vitamin are seen in severe cachexia. We saw it before triple therapy with AIDS and we're seeing it uh, sometimes with advanced cancer cachexia. Branch change amino acids were of a great interest. A recent study was not exciting. I was interested in fish oil and of course the probiotics are also an interesting area. In, the, in a world of immunotherapy, in a world of diarrhea, probiotics sound attractive. Now, in, in, a, in a polyunsaturated fatty acids, we gave patients a huge amount of fish oil and uh, it was um, salmon capsules, salmon oil versus olive oil, randomized control trial, and the only thing we got is a little bit of fishy burping, but we got nothing else in body composition. That same year, there was a much bigger study that was done by Amina Jatoy and, and the Mayo Clinic group, and we were really anxious because they were going to publish it around our time. We published our first. Unfortunately, theirs also found that fish oil was not very effective. So we need to understand better why polyunsaturated fatty acids were not that exciting. With uh, branch chain amino acids, well, there are reasons to suspect that they might have not just the nutritional value, but they might have some anti-inflammatory effect and reduce proteolysis. So there are some studies in athletes suggesting that it does improve muscle mass and performance. In cancer so far, the randomized control trial was not exciting. What about nutrition plus drugs? Could we use drugs to open that factory to make it work better? There have been some efforts not that many, but there have been some efforts of nutrition plus two and four drugs, and we're doing some ourselves. So what is the take home message? In most cases, aggressive nutrition does not improve cachexia. In some cases, of course it can. If you have a patient with head and neck cancer, who now is not just having the, the metabolic cachexia, is having a starving component. In that case, enteral nutrition might be very useful. A person with a complete bowel obstruction and a slowly growing cancer th who is going to have a major starving component, parenteral nutrition in that case might be a great idea. So in the patients who have a massive starving component, giving some nutrition might be useful. In the rest, unfortunately, it's not that useful. And remember the vitamins. What can we tell the patient? First is, Cachexia is not due to the anorexia. So by pushing yourself and turning the meal into a battle with the family getting a big plate and looking and seeing if I'm eating it or not and reducing the social value of a meal, I'm not gaining that much because it's not because I'm anorectic. Aggressive nutrition has limited usefulness and 15% morbidity and the patient, most importantly, is not starving to death. This has an enormous emotional impact. Most of our social gatherings are based around meals. Most of our religious rite is uh, based on uh, meal metaphors. So starving to death has a profound effect on families and we need to dispel the concept that this is starving to death because this has nothing to do with regular starvation. Now, what about drugs that have been tried, some of them more effectively than others? These are the drugs that are of some interest, and I'll discuss very rapidly some of them. Three of them have been random in randomized controlled trials, and those are drugs that are still used today. Uh, for AIDS, megestrol and corticosteroids were demonstrated, dronabinol, anabolic steroids, testosterone, and thalidomide. In cancer, we have established uh, effectiveness for some of them. Remember the prokinetics. We lost most of our prokinetics. The only one we have left really of some relevance is metoclopramide. It's been there for a long time, but it can help with this syndrome. The progesterone. A molecule. Both medroxyprogesterone or megestrol acetate can have some effects and corticosteroids have short effect and they have almost no cost but they have many side effects long term. So for randomized controlled trials for corticosteroids 
we do know that they do help appetite, they do help well-being, and they might help intake also. And unfortunately, uh, we have to give them for a short time because we get in trouble. But a high dose for a short time is a better way to titrate a patient than a very low dose and then keep it for a long period of time. The randomized control trials have all been positive. With regards to the two main uh, progestational drugs we have, well, there have been 13 randomized control trials. We have to use a dose higher than the traditional antineoplastic dose. It is 160 milligrams for megestrol. We have to use doses ranging between 480 and 800 milligrams a day. So it has to be a reasonably high dose of megestrol. And the effects are subjective within a week. A patient within a week tells you that they are eating a little bit more and feeling better. But weight gain is not that dramatic. This is the um, 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 review of the different evidence done by, by Marco Maltoni. And, and you can have there that uh, basically when you look at the odds ratio from the different clinical trials, the odds ratio for being better than placebo is, um, is significant there. And when you look for weight gain, the odds ratio of being better than placebo for weight gain in these studies is also suggesting that it does cause a little bit of weight gain. What type of weight gain? Probably mostly fat. People put a little bit of fat. Now, you have to use a higher dose, it's more expensive, and it needs more time, three to four weeks. If you lose a lower dose, then you have decreased cost, decreased side effects, and decreased time. So what is the current approach? Well, in patients with chronic nausea and early satiety, metoclopramide, anorexia and cachexia with good performance status, you might use megestrol, anorexia and cachexia with poor performance status, corticosteroids. The big problem with megestrol and the uh, um, uh, progestational drugs is they are pro-thrombotic. So if your patient has a history of DVT or PE or a very high risk, that is always a challenge. What about the new agents, uh, cannabinoids and uh, basically uh, some of the other agents? Well, the newer studies are looking at not only the traditional oncology parameters, but also some of the more subjective parameters. With regards to cannabinoids, this is a randomized control trial done by Florian Strasser in which he randomized patients to cannabinoid extract, tetrahydrocannabinol or placebo, and basically he found that overall appetite at week two, four, and six was not different, that um, the quality of life scales were not different, and that basically mood and nausea were not dramatically different for the three. So it was a, a quite negative study. So uh, there's no doubt uh, when people um, have um, if smoke marijuana, they sometimes get the munchies and they get a bit of an appetite. But the uh, medium to longer term effect in people in their mid 60s with polypharmacy are not really supporting that there is a big role for a smoking pot, perhaps on weekends, but not on a regular basis. So um, the thalidomide is a drug that, of course, has been used as an anti-cytokine at a lower dose, anti-angiogenesis at a much higher dose, and it does have some CNS effects. Now, it was used for erythema and dosum, that is a complication, and erythema multiformis, complications of leprosy, and it's still available in most Latin America. You can buy a big bag for 30 cents because it's been there for a very, very, very long time. And so uh, it did decrease pain, fever, and anorexia in patients with leprosy. The results are fast. So uh, it does have significant cytokine effects that is more specific than the effects of dexamethasone. It does not have this bomb on the lymphocyte effect of corticosteroids. Of course, it has multiple effects, but the peripheral neuropathy and some of the more serious effects are more associated with high dosing. With a dose of 50 to 100 milligrams, the it's very, very well tolerated. It has potential uses. What has made it very hard was that they've made this agent brutally expensive. Uh, 
So basically what happens is when I started a randomized control trial of this drug several years ago, the cost at the beginning of the study was $29 per tablet. By, uh, by patient number 13 or 14, the cost was suddenly increased by the company to $280 per tablet, and that basically killed my study because I didn't have funding to continue my, my research, a randomized control trial. But I tell uh, people, if you are willing to go for a ride, cross the Rio Grande, go to a drugstore in Tijuana and buy a bottle like this for 30 cents, and then uh, you will get some uh, symptom management there. But the idea is that you can see some improvement in symptoms. Remember, we're talking low dose. We're not talking the uh, massive doses that we use for some hematological malignancies. Now, uh, there's a randomized controlled trial in GAD using 200 milligrams. I think it was a bit of a higher dose, but the study was also encouraging. Unfortunately, when the drug cartels take over and they patent and then they increase the price, we're in trouble to be able to do the science. So we need to find ways to study these agents because they might have a beneficial effect on some of your patients. At this point, I would not advise you to prescribe it right now because of the cost component. Now, androgens are of interest. As we said before, the vast majority of the patients with advanced cancer who are cachectic that you will see will be hypogonadic if they are male. In females, there is also a problem, but the normal level of testosterone in females is not so well defined. And 60% of the androgen in female, uh, females is made by the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is very resilient. It's different from the testicle or the ovary. And so the deficit in testosterone in female patients is less severe than the one in male patients. And so a number of agents have been tried. This is oxandrolone, that is an anabolic steroid. And there have been some data suggesting that you might have some advantage by giving oxandrolone. This is an exciting drug because it's a selective androgen receptor modulator. So it's tissue specific for muscle. There have been some studies uh, in uh, limb body mass in postmenopausal women and in elderly males. And because it has a specific effect on the muscle, it's not masculinizing in females, and it has less of the other side effects in male also. So um, in the randomized control trial in patients, mostly with lung and colon, they randomized to enobosan 1, 3, or placebo. And basically, uh, the um, uh, placebo did not change lean body mass. And Novosan, both groups showed improvement in stair climbing time. This is a measure of muscle function and also stair, stair climbing power. So um, there's some interest in these agents, but there's also an interest in measuring testosterone in your patient who is cachectic and then deciding if you're going to normalize that testosterone if it's very low because hypogonadism not only is associated with cachexia, it is also associated with depression, with decreased libido, with fatigue, with a whole bunch of other symptoms. So please look at uh, these findings. Cachexia, 75% of the patients that we see there are hypogonadic. And so um, um, the, the, the big question is, it's not just uh, cachexia. There's a lot of other symptoms that are present. Now, um, the randomized control trials are not there, and if you see that, of course, that's what the company tells you. Uh, your testosterone could be running on empty, and the, the fact is we have to be careful because <coughs> testosterone might be adding problems or might just be a marker of the problems that are there. So it might be that because I'm cachectic, because I'm pro-inflammatory, now the same as the appetite is a marker, the testosterone might be a marker. So I think we do need some nice uh, clinical trials. But in a patient who's profoundly hypogonadic, I usually replace testosterone. So <coughs> the deficiency could be to all these uh, situations. And as we know, there has been one study on oxandrolone, as I showed you uh, before, and there seems to be some improvement of lean mass, um, body mass. Now, ghrelin is an interesting drug. Um, ghrelin is a hormone that I make that gives me um, appetite. And so basically, um, the, if, if the idea is if, if you get ghrelin, 
uh, analogs or ghrelin subcutaneous, could you increase your appetite, but also could you increase your lean body mass? Because it has an effect of growth hormone. It can increase your IGF-1. So the advantage is that it has an anabolic effect. It's not just making you eat more, it also has a growth hormone effect. The problem is we have the same receptor in some cancers. So there are studies in good number of patients suggesting that it does improve the appetite and it might improve a little bit the lean body mass in these patients. The, the two studies are exciting, they're in lung cancer, but a main limitation is we have to be careful with stimulating IGF-1 until we understand a bit better what it does to the cancer. And then does this help us? Is this difference enough to really make a difference in the way the patient functions and the way the patient feels? Or is it not very important? And then growth hormone has been a bit of a disappointment because um, it does increase mortality in surgery and critical care. It might be that growth hormone steals amino acids that I need to make my enzymes and my hormones, what keeps me alive, to divert those amino acids towards my muscle. So I end up having better muscle, but I don't have cortisol, I don't have enzymes, and I die. So um, there has been a bit of a disappointment, and of course there's a tumor growth potential. Combined drug therapy might be a very exciting thing for the future, and of course exercise is very important. If you manage to get that patient to eat a bit more, to have a bit of uh, megastrol, and they having more, uh, the factories open, you're not going to get more lean body mass if the patient doesn't move. So getting the patient to move is of great importance to take advantage of that increased nutrition that you're providing. So <coughs> it's very important to put the patients to move. And you can use activities of daily living, walking, upper limb, individualized plan if you want. It's very important to treat fatigue and fortunately uh, Deborah is gonna talk to us about later. <coughs> we might need to add testosterone or steroids and it's essential for increased lean body mass to do exercise. So taking advantage of putting your patient to walk is of great importance. 100% of my patients get a uh, recommendation for increased exercise. So there are pharmacological interventions we can try, and those are being tried in clinical trials now. There's symptom treatment. Remember we said that there are other things, such as nausea, anorexia, constipation. There are nutritional interventions that can be tried, and of course there's exercise. So the management of cachexia is multi-dimensional. We can try four or five things that we can do at the same time. Non-drug interventions include amino acids. I give 100% of my patients amino acids, broken down amino acids, because I, I want to make sure that they get the essential amino acids. Now, if I am catabolic, some amino acids that are not essential might become essential because I'm, I'm using them wrong. So giving amino acid mixtures might make sense, vitamins, and then remember the importance of energy. A boiled egg gives me 60 calories. A fried egg gives me 240 calories. So for the same effort of chewing and swallowing, when I'm not having appetite, I got four times more profit by frying it. And so it's very important to understand that what is healthy at one point is clearly not healthy at another point. And what is healthy in our patients is go, because you have so much difficulty swallowing and, and, and eating, go to the junk food and enjoy it. And patient and family counseling of starvation versus cachexia is very important and exercise is very important. Remember the psychosocial issues, remember the starving to death, uh, I think, remember the diet. I had so many patients on these healthy diets who are eating less than 600 calories a day because they're eating uh, broccoli and they're eating salad and they're going into a little bit of grilled fish and they do it with the best intentions in the world, but they are cachectic and then they are, they are going to die because of that. So education is important about constipation, about early satiety, about nausea, and more importantly, keep the social value of those meals, and then, of course, allow the patient and the family to express their changes in body image. Cachexia is a family problem. It's not just a patient problem. So trying to get the family 
to participate in the counseling, in the meal preparation, and all the aspects of care is, is very useful, and it might decrease the distress associated with this syndrome. So um, that's what I had for you today, so thank you very much.